This paper offers an alternative way of thinking about places as vibrant, acknowledging them to be animate, hybrid, constructed by various human and non-human agencies, made up of matter, meaning and memory, and embodying different temporalities. To illustrate the global applicability of these ideas, I draw upon a wide range of examples of archaeological and ethnographic research on human cave entanglements, including my own <coughs> PhD research on caves in Slovenia. The idea of vibrant places builds upon contemporary theoretical debate over relational persons, human and non-human agencies, and network approaches. Central to all of these is an emphasis on minds, bodies, materials, and things, and meshed in various sections and in a constant state of flux in a process of continuous creation, regeneration, and transformation within distinct systems and dynamic networks. These ideas have recently been developed within the theoretical frameworks of material culture studies, actor network theory, political ecologies and anthropologies, <coughs> symmetrical archaeology, and various other strands of interpretative archaeology. What these discourses share is their negation of the traditional dichotomies of nature-culture, organism-environment, mind-body, subject-object, past-present, domestic ritual, academic-indigenous. Instead, current approaches develop the idea that the licit binaries tend to have blurred or fluid boundaries. They also build on the premise that the traditionally perceived passive or receptive elements of the pairs, such as nature, environment, object, things and materials, actually have their own agency. In addition, they emphasize the tendency of the listed elements to interconnect on various levels to form dynamic, ever-changing systems and networks. In line with this current thinking, I reject traditional depersonalized accounts of the archaeology of the caves, centered primarily on questions of prehistoric chronologies as temporal successions. I also call for the abandonment of the frequently implied portrayal of caves and, ro and rock shelters as a blank stage upon which the economic, social and symbolic are enacted. In other words, I argue that the biographies and meanings of such places cannot simply be thought of in terms of being unidirectionally ascribed by people, a way of thinking frequently found in the archaeological literature on the human use of caves, in which they are interpreted as dwelling places, animal palaces, workshops, storage facilities, hiding places, ossuaries, theaters of rituals, and so on. Instead, I understand caves as participant, vibrant, and hybrid places, characterized by multiple symmetric and fluent connections between people, animals and plants, materials, things, places, and landscapes. In doing so, I am advocating a rapprochement of social theory, political ecology, and scientific techniques in new approaches to caves. Places in general, and caves in particular, must be observed through the prism of non-human as well as human agencies. Social reality then, rather than being intentionally imprinted by humans and their environment, emerges through various processes, relations and connections that occur between distinct nodes within societal networks consisting of humans and non-humans alike, all of whom possess a capacity to act. This non-anthropocentric, relational and symmetrical view of agency which emphasizes the mutually constitutive connections between humans and non-humans, presupposes the existence of material, multiple, and collective agencies. From this perspective, we can explore distinct forms of sociality associated with places by observing various ways in which these are structured as networks or assemblages. More specifically, we can approach caves as living, pulsating, mobile and open confederations of distinct entities and vibrant materials of various sorts, including water, stalactites and stalagmites, stone, minerals, dung, ash, people, animals, things, bones, plants and bacteria, to name but a few. Caves and rock shelters then gather. This essential trait adds to their vibrancy and place power. Due to their morphology, caves act as containers and can, for example, gather various people, animals, things and deposits, thus creating a meshwork of different nodes and agencies that can either weaken, intensify or transform each other. Often, caves hold stuff together in a particular configuration which allows for certain things, people, ideas and so forth to overlap with and sometimes to occlude others as they recede or come forwards together. 
Think, for example, of the artificial caves dug into the soft sandstone of Kinver, Kinver Edge, which were used as homes until the 1960s. When we look at one such home within the Holy Austin Rock Complex, the physicality of natural features, most notably the physicality of the sandstone, its solidness, redness, texture, cracks and folds, seamlessly flows into and merges with the physicality of cultural features, including a chimney that is built of bricks of a red hue similar to the color of the sandstone itself, and a window that is adjusted to the topography of the rock wall. Now, imagine stepping into one such home. The sight of the tiled floor and a wooden table covered with a white cloth, the sensation of warmth and the crackling of burning coal in the cast iron stove, and all other amenities necessary for cozy life would, I believe, occlude the notion of natural place and foreground the power of the cave's cultural features as a home. In addition to their ability to gather various material things, caves can also gather and hold in place thoughts, emotions, ideas and experiences. This ability stems from the relationship between a place and a memory. Places not only impress themselves upon memory, but are also impressed upon by memory. Caves, then, have the ability to act as memory anchors and to hold the past in place. This contributes significantly to their vibrancy and active participation in building a sense of belonging and to the preservation of cultural identities and traditions of both individuals and communities. Caves such as Tomincha Vajama in southwestern Slovenia, which were repeatedly visited in prehistory for the purpose of depositing the bodies of recently deceased, and accumulating ancestor bones among spectacular stalactites which gradually incorporated them certainly had this potential. As locales of lived experience and social memory, places are, in Harman Schaaf's words, deeply historical, culturally contingent and politically contested sites of human engagement. In addition, places are throbbing meshworks of various human and non-human agencies that cooperate or are in conflict and enhance or confound each other, yet at the same time also act as a whole with the vital force that is distinct from the sum of each materiality considered alone. In the case of caves, their, hybrid and vi their hybridity and vibrancy is co-shaped and co-produced by the many different geological, pedagogical, biological, social and cultural processes in play at these sites. It is essential to note that the vibrancy of many of the materials and processes involved exist independently of people, yet can significantly influence their relationships with particular caves, coming to the fore especially during ritual performances. Think, for example, of the precipitation of calcium carbonate and their consequent growth of stalagmites and stalactites in caves, or the formation of shallow water pools. These formations can, over a geological timescale of thousands of years, significantly alter the interior of caves, as well as actively influence people's relationships with particular sites. Thus, in the cave complex of Grotta Scaluria in southeast Italy, Neolithic people ritually deposited ceramic storage and serving vessels below stalactites on truncated stalagmites and adjacent to an artificially cut water pool in the deepest section of the complex, and the vessels eventually became fused to these features by calcite formations. These numerous distinct materialities exert different powers. Some parts of hybrid complex and volatile clusters may coexist, cohabit and cooperate, while others may be in conflict with each other and cause or undergo friction. There is a further difference between the human and the diverse non-human and material agencies involved. For example, the potent physicality of a cave and the topology of its stone often directly influence European Upper Paleolithic artists who touched and marked the cave walls. With images concentrated around natural shafts, animals were depicted as if issuing from or disappearing into recesses and the ends of passages, and suggestive natural outlines and reliefs on the wall surfaces were completed with other parts of animal bodies. The story of cave art thus serves as a reminder that the social reality of distinct places, rather than being imprinted by human agency onto the environment, emerges through various interactions between people, materials and places, and therefore through the interplay of various human and non-human agencies. Another evocative example concerns Trgravca rock shelter in Slovenia. 
According to ethnographic records, the fertility rite at Triglauza took place every autumn until the 1830s. It involved a nightly visit to a rock shelter by a group of five villagers from Preluja, namely an elder who led the ceremony and four maidens. At the site, the group placed grains of wheat, rye and buckwheat in a small pool on top of a stalagmite in which water dripping from the stalactite above collected. According to local lore, the two dripstones and the water dribbling from one and collecting in a pool on the other, as well as the seeds, symbolize the union of a man and a woman. The ritual act of the elder placing the grains into the pool was accompanied by incantations by the maidens calling for fertility. A few days later, the elder would return to the rock shelter alone during the day to collect the cereals which had sprouted in the meantime. On his way back to the village, he would secretly plant the young shoots into devotees' plowed and sown fields, once again uttering an incantation for abundant and fertile crops. While different materialities clustered within caves and rock shelters interact with each other, they also act as a whole. More specifically as an assemblage, they exert distributive agency, which Bennett compares to the dynamic force emanating from a spatio-temporal configuration rather than from any particular element within it. The distributive agency of a particular place can be obvious or subtle. It can be at the very background of our perception or alternatively, it can be very dramatic. At Gruta de Longo Friso in Sardinia, for example, a human skull was placed against the back wall of the cave and eventually merged with it into a hybrid due to a thick deposition of calcite. Middle Neolithic rites of passage performed there drew upon the distributive agency residing in the spatio-temporal configuration of an assemblage of human remains, a cave painting, a deposited greenstone axe, a possible boundary line of stones, the cave wall springs, darkness, diminutive light and shadows, and an inaccessible hole at the back of the cave into which some of the bones were pushed. Places are also complex assemblages of different temporalities, with traces of the past inscribed in their materialities and with such past residues living on in the present. The importance of the time component for place is illustrated by Casey, who defines place as more an event than a thing. Place is thus in a constant process of becoming, from one moment to another moment, from one event to another event, and from one action to another action. Since the relationship between time and place is symmetrical, the inverse also applies. While places are in a continuous process of formation by distinct events or actions, all events and actions are, on the other hand, in place, therefore existing in particular places rather than in abstract space. What then is the relationship between a person, a place and time? Inasmuch as relations between people and places are grounded in the material, they are also nested in the temporal. Material bodies and material places interact in time with every act embodying the distinct temporal qualities of duration, rhythm and resonance. Since places are generated and regenerated through such temporal actions, temporality of place then constitutes an essential quality of place materiality. Far from consisting of a single linear time, however, Material temporality consists of several interwoven materialized rhythms and cycles. By correlating these analytical units with concepts of human and non-human agencies, networks and assemblages, we can create a multiscalar history of, re of relationships between places and people. Such long-term deep time history, which is understood as a palimpsest of qualitatively different processes, can begin to emerge through various strategies. These include contextualizing relations between people and places first in the cultural world of particular historical periods, second within changing historical landscapes and taskscapes, and last in relation to distinct technologies and material, ritual and political practices. Writing such large histories is of course a political endeavor in itself, but while grand narratives they may indeed flatten and obscure the texture, vibrancy and detail of past worlds, they are also necessary and inescapable if we are to address the big questions of origins, identities and ways of life. Now, let us think of the material temporalities of caves for a moment. 
In their physicality, we can recognize the long-term rhythms of slow-moving geological processes acting on a time scale of several hundred to several thousand years, and being materialized in distinct geomorphological forms such as paleothems and cave conduits. Over the medium term, we might think of the ritualization of caves through repeated ritual performances where past, present, and future come together, but where time can also appear to stand still. There are also much shorter temporal flows, such as seasonal and yearly cycles of transhumans, for instance, which are embodied in interchanging deposits of humified and burned down layers within rock shelters that have been used as pans. Lastly, the short-term oscillations include singular events, such as the engraving of a name of a visitor in a cave wall, or the one-time use of a rock shelter as a refuge. The materiality of caves, then, is a hybrid assemblage not only of matter, meaning, and memory, but also of different temporalities. In practice, in order to understand the relationship between different temporal rhythms, caves, and their mediation of the social, we need a multiscalar approach, one that will acknowledge different temporal dimensions of continuity and change through time. Furthermore, by engaging with deep genealogies of places without prioritizing the horizons of meanings that have been acquired since their creation, we can avoid the trap of viewing caves and rock shelters as buried in the distant past. Instead, we need to regard them as dynamic, animate places that are part and parcel of contemporary living landscapes. Hamish Forbes, in writing on the Greek landscape of Methana, acknowledges that whereas archaeologists generally consider past places as removed from the present and no longer part of the contemporary landscape, people in traditional societies who are integrated with their landscapes view history as part of a long process which includes the present. Like landscape narratives, archaeological discourse on caves and rock shelters has generally detached them from recent past and present, reducing them to the pockets of prehistory that were of particular interest to scholars conducted research at particular sites. In Slovenia, for example, few syntheses of caves and rock shelters have adequately addressed their use during antiquity or the medieval period, not to mention the modern period. Yet many caves have continued to live as natural, cultural, social, economic, ritual, political, and historical places right up to and including the present. The Klotza rock shelter, for example, was used as a temporary dwelling place from prehistory to the end of the medieval period, and the archaeological material recovered has led to its designation as a heritage site. But few visitors learned that it has also been associated with fertility rituals and divinations performed by local people, lending its significant place power in the recent past. We must then think critically about cave narratives as constructed, generally separately, by scholars and local people. When concerned with archaeological accounts, we need to trace the development of theoretical discourses and modern scientific techniques that have influenced archaeological thought on particular sites and critically reflect on present narratives that end with the scientifically conforming airbrush discussions of caves' distant past. But we must also pay greater attention to the indigenous experiences, knowledge and belief systems that have shaped, shaped and reflected connections between local people and distinct places. In arguing this, I believe that archaeological discourse and indigenous knowledge represent two different perspectives on place power that should be viewed as complementary rather than incompatible. Archaeological debates on caves and rock shelters and their temporality should therefore also encompass issues of memory, myth, identity, storytelling, local knowledge production, and contemporary engagement with the places in question. In practice, this theoretical agenda, with its goal of conveying the richness, variety, and complexity of ways in which places mediate the social, calls for the multiscalar and interdisciplinary research. Within such an approach, critical reflexivity is essential throughout. One inescapable consequence of adopting a reflexive stance is the acknowledgement that places, including caves and rock shelters, are themselves inherently political, contested, appropriated, and controlled. Think about sacred caves, for example. Power relations are inherent in religious rituals performed in them. A prehistoric example is the manipulation of power through cave rituals by bronze and iron age groups from the hill fort of Škocian in Slovenia. Within the surrounding landscape, several caves with long-term prehistoric ritual use have been documented. 
Most notably, at the bottom of a deep vertical shaft at Mushayama, ritual deposits were identified consisting of hundreds of intentionally broken and partially melted bronze objects, including spare heads, axes, swords, helmets, knives and sickles, bracelets, rings, fragments of bronze vessels, burnt animal bones and charcoal. The typology of these objects, dated between the 12th and 8th centuries BC, indicate that their provenance covered a wide span stretching from Greece in the south to the Pannonian Plain in the north and the Italian peninsula in the west. The importance of people living at Scotia was clearly associated with their performance, maintenance and control of cave rituals within a sacred landscape intimately related to the awe-inspiring natural karstic phenomena. On the other hand, the most recent painful and contested example of inherently political nature of caves is the use of karstic shafts as locales of post-war execution between May 1945 and January 1946 in the aftermath of the Second World War. Such caves have loomed large in collective memory and identity not only through their suppressed absence, but also through acts of concealment and secrecy. Over the decades, they have become a material metaphor of the rotting secret, aptly revealing tensions and interplay between the politics of blame, guilt and accountability, denial and mourning, as well as attempts at the revision of history. Like other post-war communist crimes in Yugoslavia, the topic remains highly divisive in Slovenian society and politics, despite official state recognition of the executed as political victims in the years following the declaration of Slovenian independence in 1991. More than six decades on, no consensus has yet been reached either in public opinion or in politics, and a hard line is drawn between those who view the post-war executions as collateral and inescapable war damage and those who condemn them as criminal acts. To conclude, the cave archaeology has come a long way since the beginning of the 1990s, particularly in terms of the range of interpretative approaches and ideas now available to scholars. However, I see plenty of opportunity for rethinking the significance of caves in the past and present. Here, with the help of a range of theories, I have represented caves as animate, vibrant places that act on us and actively participate in the construction of social reality, and as pulsating assemblages of various human and non-human agencies which interact with social structures on different timescales. These ideas are widely applicable. Indeed, I regard them as the basis for a productive way of thinking about places and their temporality in general. Thank you.